In our next section, we're going to look at intermediate system to intermediate system or ISIS routing on Nexus. And uh, we've already seen this before behind the scenes in Fabric Path. We'll see that it's going to be used again behind the scenes in over the transport virtualization and also behind the scenes in application centric infrastructure or ACI. But in those cases, ISIS is going to be very plug and play. Uh, we could potentially use this for the underlying fabric routing or the underlay. Uh, fabric routing for the clause fabric of VXLAN, either VXLAN Flood and Learn or VXLAN BGP EVPN. But in the vast majority of cases, you would generally see that OSPF is going to be a little bit more popular uh, to run than ISIS in these type of environments, simply because most engineers have more exposure to uh, OSPF configuration over ISIS. But from a behind the scenes point of view, we'll see that OSPF and ISIS are very similar in terms of their mechanisms of uh, what they're trying to accomplish by uh, building the shortest path trade. So as I mentioned, the protocol is called intermediate system to intermediate system, which basically means router to router communication. An intermediate system is a router. Originally, there was uh, two types of systems. There was the end system, which was the ES, and then the intermediate system, the IS, and there were two different protocols. There was ESIS, which was between the host and the router, and then IS to IS, which is the, the router to router protocol. Okay, this is what we're talking about, which is basically the routing protocol, the IGP. Okay, so it is link state similar to OSPF. In most cases in typical designs is used in the core of service provider networks. Okay, reason why is that it is a very simple flat network design. You don't need to worry about a lot of the hierarchy uh, that OSPF imposes. And it also supports both IPv4 and IPv6 routing within the same protocol stack. So in the case of OSPF, it's two separate protocols. You have OSPF version 2 and OSPF version 3. And IS to IS, IPv4 and IPv6 routings are extensions to the core protocol. Okay, same reason as why Fabric Path was using ISIS, because they just wrote another custom extension in order to advertise those type link values. Same as with overlay transport virtualization. Yeah, you can think of it kind of like how BGP works, where you have your underlying transport that's based on TCP, and then you have your application data, which would be like your IP route, your IPv6 route, your EVPN route, but they're using the same underlying transport. Same is true with ISIS, that the underlying transport is the connectionless network stack, or CLNS, but the application data inside of the protocol is going to be your IPv4 routes, your IPv6 route, your fabric path switch ID, your OTV MAC address, and then CLNS is going to be actually building the shortest path trade. Now, since it's not an IP protocol, it comes from the original ISO CLNS stack. It means that the addressing format is different than regular IP. Okay, it uses what's called an ISO NSAP, or a Network Entity Title Address, which is a variably length address that is from 8 bytes to 20 bytes. Okay, it's going to look like this, where the A's are the area ID, the S is the system ID, and then the N is the N selector. Okay, in most cases, you'll see that this address is going to have the format of 49.000 something, okay, followed by some value, whatever, 1111, 1111, 111100. The reason why is that anything that starts with 49.xxxx, this is private addressing from the original ISO NSAP uh, standard. So you can think of it kind of like RFC 1918. It's like the 10 network, 172.16 to 31, 192.168. Okay, but technically, in our case, it doesn't really even really matter what the net address is because it's not being publicly routed uh, over the internet. Okay, it's always going to be some locally significant value within the, uh, the IGP domain. Okay, what the net address, what the net address is going to control, though, is what we call the level of adjacency. Okay, where OSPF uses areas for its hierarchy, like area zero is the backbone, the non-area zero is the, is the non-transit area, ISIS calls these levels. Okay, so level two in ISIS is gonna be like OSPF area zero. Level one in ISIS is gonna be like a non-transit area. Okay, more specifically, level one behaves like a not so totally stubby area in OSPF. Okay, what this means is that it's going to use a default route to get out to the area border router, which we call the level 1, level 2 router, the L1, L2. Then you can do redistribution into the area 
but the redistribution is going one way. So you're basically leaking specific routes from level one into level two, but by default, you don't leak routes from level two into level one. It only has a default route to get out to the core. Now, we'll see in data center environments, typically you don't even use this hierarchy. You either just configure flat level one everywhere or flat level two everywhere. That's basically what Fabric Path or uh, OTV are doing. They're using a single area on all of the devices. So the upper scaling limit would be the amount of nodes in the database because there's no hierarchy to, to hide the topology details like you would see in multi-area OSPF. Okay, in our case, we're just going to pick one of the levels, either level one or level two, and then configure that on all of the interfaces. Okay, but outside of this, assuming that you were using hierarchy, the L1, L2 router, that behaves like the area border router in OSPF. So it's going to set a default route into level one by setting what's called the attached bit. And then it's going to have all of the more specific routes in the level two area. Okay, we'll see that when we run this on the CLI, the ISIS process is going to default to both. It's going to run both level one and level two. What this means from an efficiency point of view is that you're doubling the utilization. So you're doubling the, the global RAM, you're doubling the, uh, the, uh, the global CPU okay, to, uh, to create the shortest path tree. Into the FIB, though, the actual TCAM or the line card, you're not doubling the memory because only one of the route entries is going to be installed. But from the protocol mechanisms behind the scenes, it doesn't make sense to have both databases. Okay, it's like an OSPF, if you were to run area zero and area one in every single link, it doesn't make sense to do that. You wouldn't want to, to maintain two separate adjacencies because at the end of the day, you're only going to use one copy of the route when you install it into the, uh, the routing table. Okay, same is true with ISIS here. Okay, so typically, we're going to get around this by either de de defining the level globally under the process, which is going to affect all interfaces, or we could define it specifically under the interface. Say this link is level one or level two, but not both at the same time. Okay, we'll also see that ISIS uses network types just like OSPF does. The difference though is that there's only two network types. In, I, in OSPF, we have a bunch of them like point to point, broadcast, non broadcast, point to multi point, so on and so forth. In the case of ISIS, there's only two there's broadcast and there's point to point. So broadcast is going to be used in an Ethernet interface, or technically a token ring link or a FIDI link from legacy networking. Uh, point to point is going to be anything that is physically point to point, like a T1 PPP link, a GRE tunnel would be point to point. Okay, just like we saw in OSPF though, since in our designs from Nexus Data Center, the switches or the layer three switches, layer three routers are going to be physically connected point to point. It means that typically you would configure the ISIS network as point to point to cut down on the, the amount of link state packets that you need inside of the database. So just like how OSPF has the designated router, ISIS has the designated intermediate system. And again, intermediate system basically means router. So DR, DIS means the same thing. Okay, just like an OSPF, there's an election process to figure out who's going to be the designated intermediate system. Okay, and it's going to be based on a priority, just like OSPF is. So you can change this manually. If not, it's going to use the highest MAC address, which is called the subnetwork point of attachment. Okay, but it basically just looks at the higher layer two value. Okay, if that's uh, a tie, then you go to the, or excuse me, if the priority is a tie, uh, then you go to the MAC address. Okay, one of the differences between OSPF and ISIS here, though, is that ISIS election does support preemption. So whatever box is the higher value of the priority is automatically going to be elected the DIS, the Designated Intermediate System. Okay, when we go to form ISIS adjacency, just like OSPF, there's some additional prerequisites we need to think about. Okay, first and foremost, the level of adjacency has to match. Okay, so both of them have to be level two or both of them have to be level one. If we're doing level one adjacency, we also need to make sure that the area identifier matches. The area ID comes from the network entity title, the net address. So we'll see that when we configure this under the ISIS process, if we're using level one, we need to make sure those numbers are the same. It's going to be anything to the left of the system identifier. System ID, you can think of it like the router ID within the level, and then the area ID is going to be the hierarchy of the, uh, the level one, uh, level two. Okay, beyond that, just like in OSPF, MTU has to be the same. 
Okay, the behavior of the specific mechanism is different in ISIS than it is in OSPF. OSPF is gonna include this number as part of the database description or the DBD as you go through the exchange stage. In the case of ISIS, it tries to detect the MTU just by setting the packet to that length. So if you set your MTU to 9216 and you do a packet capture, you'll see that the ISIS hello is close to that value. It's about 9216. Okay, the end result is the same though, that if the MTU is mismatched, if I'm using 1500, you're using 9000, we can't form an adjacency. Okay, reason why is that you send me 9000, my interface is simply gonna drop it. So again, as a general rule, just like an ISIS, you wanna use jumble frames everywhere. Okay, then if the application needs it, you can use it, but other way around would not be true. If the application needs jumbo frames, like for iSCSI, and the network infrastructure is not set up for it, and then it's gonna be a problem. Okay, and especially for protocols like IP storage, you don't wanna to have to do fragmentation for that. You do wanna allow uh, the application to use jumbo frames if it needs them. Okay, beyond this, the network type also needs to match. So either broadcast or point to point. And again, there's only two of them here.